Hi, everybody. We have something I think all of you are going to be very interested in today to talk about if you're feeling that there's something seriously amiss in the world. And I know most of us are. As I've talked about in interviews with Barbara Hanclow and a couple of other people, we have dimensions that interface with ours and also beings that can reach in and interfere with humanity. And I think some of us are feeling this. And one of the people that addresses this really beautifully is Debbie Solaris. And I had her on Gaia with me. It was a very popular show. And we went out and extended the conversation to many different galactic species. Today, we're going to drill down into what we call reptilian consciousness, the reptilian dimension and reptilian entities. So we go to Debbie. Debbie, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this one. I think people are in a lot of pain and very curious about what, what's going on in the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, anyway, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I love Regina, so it's uh, always <laughs> excited to, <laughs> to well, be talking to her. So, um, admiration. Debbie, tell us how this ha began because you, you were not a likely candidate. It's not as though you were sitting with your crystal ball meditating. Tell us a little bit about your life when this interesting event occurred that changed the course of your personal history. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, that's a great story. Uh, it's an interesting story. Anyway, I, I started off as a very ordinary human being. I was actually a Navy veteran. Um, I, I served in the U.S. Navy for six years as a hospital corpsman slash preventive medicine tech. Um, also uh, worked in public health for a lot of years. And I was probably the most skeptical person out there. Um, I didn't have any interest in extraterrestrials, any interest in the paranormal or the metaphysical world. Uh, my husband at the time, or my, who's, who's still my husband actually, uh, is more interested in those topics. Um, he he used to read some UFO magazines, so I would I would read them out of curiosity, but I was still pretty skeptical um, until I had my own. I guess, uh, fateful uh, UFO contact experience. Uh, it happened out of the blue in 2012. I had two experiences where I was on board an extraterrestrial craft. Um, this was, I think, an out-of-body experience. It didn't happen. It happened in alternate dimensions. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but those experiences completely changed my life, completely changed the trajectory of my journey, my soul's journey. Um, and uh, it got me on the path that I'm currently on now, which is uh, I'm, a, I'm a galactic historian slash Akashic Records reader guide slash starseed intuitive. And as a result, you have a lot of different people who are coming to you for um, kind of questions about their own origins. And the reason I wanted to do this with you today is because I'm starting to hear from people from different quarters saying, my God, I'm having these visions, particularly of reptilians and such, and um, wondering why them? Is there something in their own DNA that is creating this contact? And these are all valid questions. I think it's fair to say the human species is a hybrid species. Oh, so absolutely. Yes, we, we, have all contain, kinds of genetics. we contain the genetics of at least 22 different star races, including reptilian. Okay, so we, um, we might have uh, certain soul contracts with some reptilian groups that we're consciously not aware of, hence the uh, interactions with reptilians. Exactly. And it's disconcerting for people who aren't expecting it. So what I'd like to do is do a little primer here. You do a really beautiful job uh, in, in your own site just has amazing imagery and also stories that go along with it. So let's start back. I had my notes lined out in a linear way, which was going back to Lyra. Okay. Mm -hmm. where human form you say was modeled and we looked very different, and I related to this story. So let's talk about Lyra, the human form, start there, okay? Okay, um, in the beginning, okay, so I always kind of start from the very beginning, yeah. because that's where everything starts. But uh, in, in the beginning of at least our history of the Milky Way, uh, the Milky Way was uh, actually formulated in uh, to be... Uh, 
a, I guess, a experimental site for the descent uh, into physicality or the separation from source. Okay, so uh, initially this was supposed to happen in Andromeda Galaxy, but Andromeda Galaxy was just too high vibrational, so uh, it was determined that a new galaxy would be formulated to start this descent into physicality. Um, and this is common throughout uh, the multi-universes. So you have universe upon universe that experience you know this this sort of separation from source um so this this experiment it ended in one universe and started off in our universe uh, uh so when it was formulated um it was determined that lyra the constellation of lyra because it was considered to be the most uh inhabitable for physical life was to be created to be the beginning of this physical reality here in our in our galaxy. And so there was co-creator beings who came from another universe that, that actually started the whole cycle here in our universe. And these were known as, repti uh, not reptilian, sorry, as, as feline beings. Um, so there, so, uh, so there was feline beings from another universe that came to kind of jumpstart the process here in our universe, in our galaxy. And so they were creating kind of hybridization of beings in Lyra of these beings that were a mix of simian and, uh, and feline genetics, which created the human race. They decided to create two human races. You would think they would just create one, but they were following the source template. The source template is mother goddess consciousness and father god consciousness. So they decided to create two human races that were representing these different consciousness groups. Uh, the uh, mother goddess consciousness uh, human race was called the Vegas or the Vegans um, from the star system of Vega. So Vega is the biggest star system in the constellation of Lyra. Um, Vega, I think they were the race that was created first actually, um, because they were a little bit more advanced. Um, the Vega people were more inwardly focused. Uh, they were more focused on spirituality and healing, more of a feminine expression, okay? Uh, they had deep blue skin. Uh, so I always like to kind of compare this race to, uh, to maybe the Hindu gods or um, even if you want to get really fanciful, uh, you know, the, the Navi people in the Avatar movies, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, so everybody, everybody loves those movies. So I like to kind of use a popular uh, movie to kind of illustrate what they might have been like. And their planets were beautiful. Okay, uh, the white Lyrans, who are more the, more the Caucasian uh, ver version, were more the father god consciousness oriented group. So these, these folks lived in the other star systems that were located in the Lyran system. Um, they were predominantly more outwardly focused, more physical. Um, mo many of them were agricultural. So, um, so farming, I guess, at the time uh, for many cent uh, centuries or, or thousands of years in, in the Lyran system was very, very prominent and very popular. Uh, so you have these representations of these two groups, and for thousands of years, they lived peacefully in their star systems. So they didn't know any violence. They didn't know deception. They didn't know adversity. They just lived in these beautiful paradise planets, and uh, and you know I think I think they just expected things to always be, be be good and perfect. So that's kind of uh, kind of the beginning. Well, now just to validate a couple things, just from a personal level, from the own my own research and experience over many decades now, um, one of the things that's popped up is in when you go back to Atlantean culture, the Atlantean culture even there was representation by 
a lot of different skin colors and not just necessarily from brown to white, yeah, um, exactly. and including red and blue and mm -hmm. even powdery white. So that mm -hmm. does overlay with uh, information that I have also um, that has been shared with me over the decades. In addition to that, in interviewing Sarah Breskman, uh, the, I think it's called Journey to Atlantis, a hypnotist who had a really uh, very clear client who went back into Atlantean times. Both of them had seen feline, human, feline mm -hmm. type of hybrids in their experience there as well. So I'm just looking for connecting points for people to kind of, as we're putting pieces together here. Now let's talk about when the conflicts began and when the reptilians really kind of entered the scene. And also one more thing, it is also my understanding and personal experience that in very, very, very ancient times, the humans were, as you have said on your site in our previous interview, much, much taller, 10, 12 feet tall, four to 500 pounds was the size of the humans at one time. And that was true in Atlantis as well. And we see some of this depicted in Egyptian uh, glyphs, for example. So, oh, absolutely. That yeah. is very true. Uh, I think a lot of people think that, oh, Lyran humanoid, oh, they must be like earth humans. No, they weren't. They were much more advanced humans. So they were what I call higher humans. They were higher dimensional they were taller, they were bigger, more muscular, and definitely uh, they weighed quite a bit more. So, you know, 400, 500 pounds, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, a good, that's a good weight if you're 12 feet tall. So Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Liz, it's a perfect weight for a 12 footer. Um, so now let's go to what happened. Where did we start having the um, introduction of the reptilians into the scene? And let's talk a little bit uh, in a nuanced way about who they were, what they were. Okay. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I always kind of saw this as being an interesting little tidbit that why was Lyra created so close to Draco? You know, so why did they have a light system so close to a dark system? Okay. Um, the Draconians were actually... Uh, I think a lot of people think they originated from Draco. They actually didn't. They were kicked out of another universe. They were causing a whole lot of disruption in this other universe. And they were kicked out by what I saw in the records were by avian type beings. So these were avian beings from a different universe that I think uh, got tired of the reptilians and somehow teleported them into our universe. Uh, so they ended up in Draco. Okay, okay so for just a moment, we're talking avian type beings. And remember, if you go throughout Egyptian history, you're going to see the representations through both Horus and mm -hmm. Toth, right? Of very advanced, uh, you could say, hybrid beings that do appear in avian form. So it's possible that these were people from a higher level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, okay. Yeah. Continue on. Yeah. So the, the avian beings, uh, I guess, kicked these uh, reptilians out and they ended up in Draco and they weren't very happy. Okay. Because, they lived in beautiful lush uh, systems in the alternate universe, and then they got kicked in, into a, a system, Draco, was, which was very barren, had very few resources. Uh, and so, you know, their mindset, because they were always service to self, was we need to conquer other systems, especially the ones that have more, more resources, more natural resources, more minerals, more whatever. Um, so they saw the Lyran system and they thought, wow, they have really abundant resources. Uh, we need to conquer that system. And they and wanted so to get they, back to the good old days where, back, the, yeah. Yeah, back to the good old days. Yeah. So, um, so they were thinking, you know, we can probably deceive those beings. They don't seem very smart. Okay. Or, or very, you know, so, um, you know, and, and so I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, well, maybe there was some conflict between, you know, the Lyrans and the, and the Draconians. I think it was all a big part of the deception. 
And I actually think that the whole biblical story of Adam and Eve and the snake was an allegorical story that represented the deception of, of Lyra, okay? Uh, you know, the ending of the paradise, okay, which was Lyra, okay? Um, and so the draconians being reached out to the Lyran saying, hey, you know, I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing here a bit, but... Uh, Hey, we're your neighbors. Uh, we we like we notice you guys have a lot of great resources. We want to do a treaty with you, so or some sort of a trade trade agreement that we'll trade some of our technologies because we've had technologies for four billion years with some of your abundant natural resources. And the Larens were, I mean, this was a pretty enticing deal for them mm -hmm. because. They, they were thinking, you know, we could use some advanced technologies. We're developing our technologies right now, but we know we're behind. Um, and so this was a really, um, a deal that was too good to, uh, to pass up for them. Um, and so I think they were kind of interested in getting to know the Draconians more, so they invited them on their planets. And uh, when they invited them on their planets, the uh, Draconians took this as an opportunity to scope out the weak areas of their planets, of which there were many, because they were su such a peaceful race of, uh, of people, they didn't have any weapons whatsoever, or very few, very few weapons. And so the Draconians saw this, oh, we can ambush them easy, take over their system, and take over other systems, you know, you know, consequently. The other thing about the draconian race is that they have a caste system, okay? So they're not all the same. Um, uh, you have your upper tier draconians, which most people know as dragons. Um, and they're kind of big and menacing looking, but the dragons were actually kind of neutral. They weren't really the ones that, I guess, initiated the Lyra Draconian Wars, uh, but for some reason they just to chose to stay out of it. Um, I did see some instances, instances in the records where they might have helped certain individuals that they had an, a relationship with, but um, for the most part, they didn't want any part of it. Um, the warrior cast, this is the second tier reptilians, are the ones that we see in pop popular ufology where um, these beings were kind of like what we would call the lizzies or the lizards looking beings um, mm -hmm. they kind of have they, they stand upright and they have like a crocodile looking head and tail and scales um, uh, these beings were the warrior cast and they were the ones um, I think there was a rivalry between the dragons and the the uh, the warrior cast reptilians, uh, the warrior cast wanted to be top tier. And so they figured if they could conquer many more systems, they would topple the dragons off their pedestal, so to speak. Um, and so part of it was rivalry within their own, their own hierarchy, okay. Um, and some of it was just that they wanted to conquer other systems, you know, they, they didn't have any regard for coexisting with other races. You know, they, they wanted to be in control. And this has been kind of the template that they followed for, for millions of years. Okay, well, there's something here, you know, that we have to interface with, and that is, as you said from the very beginning, you know, this whole notion of multidimensionality. Mm -hmm. So here we have a situation now where we have these beings, a warrior class of beings who is accustomed to winning by force. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to do when you have more uh, advanced, higher consciousness, uh, meaning less aggressive species, very easy to dominate them. Mm -hmm. And so now, now we're talking about an interface at some point with earthlings. So let, let's go there. How did they end up going then from the Lyran system to ultimately coming to earth? and then ultimately operating out of the fourth dimensional field. Now that's interesting. Uh, 
that's a really, there's a really long answer to that. So we have to kind of abridge it. <laughs> abridge it so. yeah, please do. It's yeah, we'll abridge it. So, um, uh, so the, the reptilians continued to conquer other systems, uh, most notably Orion. I think, you know, we, uh, we can always talk about Orion more at, more at depth um, at a later time. But uh, I think a lot of people that have had readings with me know that always, always kind of, jokingly referred to Orion as being uh, like Star Wars, you know, uh, which is actually, I think Star Wars simulates, you know, the whole story of the Orion Wars, which was, you know, lasted for millions of years. Uh, but I think what happened with Orion was that the reptilians in Orion, uh, there were some negative factions that decided that they, uh, cause Orion was now shifting to unity consciousness. So there was enough, um, I guess, beings on Orion that wanted to shift to the light consciousness. Uh, but there were certain negative factions in the Orion empire that did not want to become a team player, so to speak. So they, they saw earth as a great opportunity to conquer yet another system. Okay. So, um, Initially, they colonized Earth. Uh, this was way before Lemuria and Atlantean times. So a lot of the um, dinosaurs, you know, and some of the, so they created, they, they uh, brought their own uh, samples of DNA to Earth and created beings that were kind of like lesser versions of themselves. So dinosaurs would be an example of that. And even some of the reptilians we currently see here on earth today, like lizards and, um, and snakes and, you know, uh, rep, uh, reptiles, you know, those are all uh, lesser versions of these reptilian beings that uh, continue to, you know, propagate on earth. Uh, but their interest was more to take over um, all of earth. So, you know, including the humans. Okay, so, well, um, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Insert, I'll just insert one tiny story. You said colonize Earth. Now, uh, just briefly, this is anecdotal. Okay. I had a reading, I didn't have a reading, I did a reading on top of the Bosnian pyramids. Oh, very and, cool. Okay. Yeah, and I, and, and I was shown, which is the first time I've ever encountered seeing reptilians, I was shown that this was one of their colonization projects. There, there's not just that one pyramid, but there are a few, but that they had abandoned it and others tried to come back, long story, but that was one, just one example where these pyramidal structures were because I think that pyramidal structures have shown up a lot with reptilian colonization, although not Absolutely. all pyramids are a result of reptilian production. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, uh, and I think other star races as well. You know, yes, because, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting that speaking of pyramids, you know, the, the, the pyramids of Giza are directly aligned with the belt stars of Orion, which yes. is, you know, one of the places where the reptilians, you know, pretty much uh, colonized. You know? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. So let's talk about the colonization. So we have them here first in the beginning with uh, creating, use, using DNA to create lesser versions of themselves, what are still to this day called uh, species, called the reptile species, which right. are many different sizes, shapes, and so forth. Let's talk about the extension now of the colonization beyond that and then get ultimately get into where they interface with humans. Okay. Uh, you know, so they uh, decided, um, I think, I think when the dinosaurs got wiped out, so the dinosaurs got wiped out, um, they went underground for a while. Okay. So you hear of these underground bases, you know, reptilian bases. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think eventually um, as Lemuria and, Atlantis was being, uh, you know, these civilizations were being developed. Uh, they had the idea of let's infiltrate the Atlantean civilization because that was the one that had more technology. Uh, Lemuria was actually very low technology system uh, or civilization. I mean, it, they were highly spiritual. 
okay. Um, somehow these uh, draconian factions uh, convinced the Atlantean gov uh, government that Lemuria was their enemies. I don't know how they did that because Lemurians were such peaceful people, but you know, Is propaganda it, can, can convince people of anything, I guess. So. Yeah, and this overlays very nicely with Sarah Breskman and Jen came to when they knew nothing about any of this. They were total virgins to these topics. Yeah. When they did their regression work, they were coming up with a very, very similar story to what you're telling right now. Yeah. So they, they were convinced that Lemurians were their enemies. And so they, they went into a war with Lemuria and even though Lemuria was very advanced spiritually, they didn't have the technology or, you know, the capabilities to withstand, you know, the high level Atlantean technologies. So um, Atlantis destroyed Lemuria and Lemuria sank. And uh, there's remnants of Lemuria still on our planet, uh, Hawaii being one of them. Uh, and I was stationed in Hawaii for four years when I was in the military. So I'm, Hawaii is near and dear to my heart. And I'm a Lemurian soul anyway. But, um, but, uh, but there's remnants here and there of Lemuria. But uh, pretty much when Lemuria was destroyed, Earth shifted from the fifth dimension to the third. And so these beings um, figured, oh, well, you know, now that we're, we have Earth at a lower dimension, we can really control these the planet um, because these people are no longer at higher consciousness. Okay, so so it's been like that for I would say thousands upon thousands of years ever since to you know one degree or another. I hope you're enjoying this video because if you are, there are dozens more like it on my site, all supported by people like you. So if you'd like to keep this work rolling in and join our community, just click on the Patreon button at reginameredith.com. That also gives you access to insider commentary, my live book club, and other live events with special guests. So join in. Thanks. So now we have one thing that the, they are is master geneticists. Mm -hmm. And we know if we look back into Atlantean history, even if we look at modern history, but certainly going back into Atlantean history um, and into mythology, there was a lot of uh, genetic manipulation going on in the day. Mm -hmm. All kinds of strange species and hybrid species had been created, most of which have died out, of course. Um, right. It's problematic when you're blending species. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's talk about how the reptilians began working with those programs and inserting their DNA in with the existing human DNA. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's always been a topic that's fascinated me uh, personally uh, because I have a lot of clients who carry, you know, RH negative blood, uh, which is not necessarily completely reptilian. I wouldn't go as far as to say that, but it's definitely extraterrestrial. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's an extraterrestrial component to that particular blood type. But um, I, what happened when the, uh, when the draconians, uh, for, you know, factions infiltrated Atlantis, okay, uh, they convinced the Atlantean scientists that we need to do experiments on, we need to do genetic modification experiments on many different types of beings. Uh, let's combine human with reptilian. Let's combine human with animal. Let's combine human with plant. Let's combine plants with animals. And so they came up with these, uh, I guess, uh, horrifying, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, like the Minotaur and, you know, some of these, rep, you know, mythological creatures were actually the result of these Atlantean genetic modifications. Right. And so right. there was quite a few humans that were also being inserted with reptilian DNA. Okay. Um, and so that's why you see human people, quite a few with varying levels of or varying percentages of reptilian DNA in their DNA. Okay. Um, and they're, uh, so when you say that, you're not saying that shows up on ancestry.com. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so how are they identifying humans with, under what kind of genetic testing are they finding humans with the reptilian DNA? 
I don't, I don't know if there's any, any genetic <laughs> testing out there that I think it's the junk DNA, honestly. I think well, it's that's what I was going to say. Can. Yeah, 95% junk DNA, meaning unidentifiable. Right, unidentified. Or, because uh, I, I know when I did my DNA test, they said you have like 2% unidentified DNA, which, you know, is probably extraterrestrial, I don't, for all I know. But yeah, I, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think there's a test out there yet. We'll say, oh yes, you. I know there's some for Neanderthal because I think yes, I have. Yes, that does show up. That does show up, yeah, because I have Neanderthal genetics, but um, but I don't see I don't see any for reptilian just yet. <laughs> Maybe in the future. So let's look at from your understanding and what you've learned through the years. What the result of that genetic engineering was by putting the reptilian DNA in with the human. What was the result of it? Um, yeah. You got various types of humans here on this planet. So uh, you got humans that lean very, very benevolent, you know, that maybe have higher percentages of reptilian, uh, not, excuse me, uh, Pleiadian DNA or Syrian DNA. And then you got some that are just not very nice people, you know, they, you know, they, they kind they're kind of more self-centered or more narcissistic or, uh, and I, I've seen this even within my own family, <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but uh, there are some, some members of my family that I kind of wonder, like, hmm, I wonder how, how many, how much percentage of reptilian DNA they have, you know. Well, because, do you see this quite a bit among clients? Because oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is going yeah. on, and so let's look at how it's trickled down into today, into the modern world today. We know there was colonization. We know they had to pull up roots. A lot of times we know they had to go underground and that they continue to influence humanity from the wings of the fourth dimension, bleeding into the third dimension, and also working very directly in physical form with people in certain positions or certain locations, certain high positions of power, for example, that still exists. So let's talk about today's reptilian influence because people are finding their way to you because they're freaked out about it. Oh yeah, no, I get, um, and I actually get a few clients that were reptilian star seats. You know, they Mm -hmm. had, you know, I mean, there's a a couple of examples I think on my, my YouTube channel, you know, so, uh, but in regards to, I guess, modern history or, you know, modern Mm -hmm. days, um, uh, so kind of what I see is that these groups were always in power. So these groups were always in positions of leadership. So they became what we now know as the Illuminati or the the dark factions or, you know, uh, certain members of royalty or certain members of, of politics, you know. So uh, there, there's actually a few... Uh, politicians even in the United States that I'm pretty sure are reptilian shapeshifters. Okay. They, I'm not going to name who they are, but I I I will tell you this and I probably shouldn't, I hope it doesn't get me in trouble. Yeah. But David Ike, who, who's a friend of mine. Yeah. Once told me we're, we're having tea, right. And uh, he was at the house and he was saying that he spoke to someone he was close to Mm -hmm. who was high up in intelligence in the military. And the man told him this story. He did not believe in any of this, but was completely freaked out while watching someone addressing the large group of, you know, high up people Mm -hmm. at the podium. He saw him shift into a reptilian and it just Mm -hmm. drained his blood from his body. He was so shocked to see this, this shape shifting happening right before his eyes. And this is someone David was very close to. Yeah, so, gotcha. anyway. yeah, yeah, I've seen that as well. I think people that have a really well-developed third eye, um, you know, that are able to see beyond the third dimension uh, will oftentimes see this shape shifting. And uh, I've seen it myself personally. Um, I've had instances where I've seen shapeshifters. Uh, Uh, It's only happened uh, maybe less than a handful of times, but I have seen it personally, so I know it exists, and uh, I I know I'm not making it up, you know, so. I just wanted to offer David's experience because. Yeah, no, I think David's experience is very right on. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's, 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 it
Yeah. yeah, you're not alone. Well, also, aside from um, masterful skills in genetics and genetic engineering, uh, the reptilian species have very powerful minds and can reach in with their minds and uh, interfere, cause disturbances with humanity. And I would like to talk about it kind of working from the wings with humanity right now, working on humanity, through humanity, What's going on? What are they attempting to do and how are they doing it? All we can feel is this dark grip we're in and chaos. And of course we want to blame it on someone and they don't bear the brunt of all of it, but they're involved. Oh, definitely involved. Uh, I think they've been doing it for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, they've infiltrated our governmental systems. They inf definitely infiltrated our religious systems. Uh, to keep you know control over humanity um at first i think because people were not as consciously aware it was e extremely easy for them to uh you know to deceive people you know through the guise of oh this is what you should do for the good of the country or this is what you should do if you're a good christian or if you're good um islam islamic person or a good Jew jewish Jew jewish person you know, so so they do this under the guise of religion and 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 even societal norms. You know, so uh, so there's certain societal norms uh, that are in place uh, that keeps people under control. Okay, um, nowadays they do it through media. Okay, uh, yeah, they do it through uh, mainstream TV. A lot, if you notice, a lot of the shows are really dark. Uh, mainstream news um, is also very uh, fear based, you know. So, highly controlled. Yes, yeah. are controlled. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and they do it through music, through Hollywood. Um, yeah, no longer is, is the, sh the movies really inspirational. They're, they're kind of dark and scary a lot of times. And it keeps our vibration low. So it keeps pe people down. And so they, they don't have that raised consciousness or that raised vibration in order to connect with, uh, you know, their divine aspects of themselves. Very true. Even in mundane things like TV sitcoms and such, people mm -hmm. treat each other very rudely and they're derogatory toward each other. Um, it's, it's not uplifting and beautiful. By and large, no, there are very, very, very few shows that I would consider to be uplifting or beautiful yeah um, uh, yeah both my my husband and i we don't watch tv for that reason uh, we we watch alternative news and alternative media such as gaia for instance um uh because we want to watch uplifting and uh positive uh po positive programming but um but yeah, they do it through many means. And even the music today is very low vibrational. The, the beat is super low vibrational. Um, it's, uh, so I, I have quite a few clients who are musically inclined who have been, whose, whose missions are to raise the vibration of music. So, um, and you know, a lot of sound healers you know, that are also trying to do the, the, um, that, that as well. I think it's really important that this is where we have a wonderful advantage that we have a natural inclination toward beauty as human beings. Most yeah. people do. We have a natural inclination toward symmetry, uh, beautiful colors, which are all frequency based. We even have a natural inclination to be drawn to uh, high frequency sounds, as you say, musical notes and chord combinations and such. We know it. We can tell sweetness when we hear it. A lot of it's not being made available to us, but if we go search for it, it's mm -hmm. there. And there are so many amazing modalities of healing that draw on sound and color. So if we turn to the natural world of frequencies around us, it seems like that's one way to combat the lowering of the planetary frequencies that is happening on a scale of consciousness, it seems. Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of my clients ask, how do I raise my frequency? And it's actually not as hard as you think. It's, it's just doing things that bring you joy in your life. Uh, you know, meditating, you know, uh, maybe uh, having a yoga practice or eating high vibrational foods, listening to beautiful music, 
laughter. So, you know, watching, you know, good, good, clean comedy shows will help raise vibration. I do that myself a lot because yeah. sometimes things get, uh, th things get hard even for galactic historians and we need a little... <laughs> So, um, I hear you. Sometimes it's even hard to find really good, clean humor. I'm really kind of sick of the way comedy has gone too. Oh yeah, no, it's got it's gotten pretty. Some of it's gotten really nice, but um, but there's still some clean comics out there, and, sure. uh, and they, they make us laugh. Yeah. So laughter, music, high frequency food, friendship. Mm -hmm. So how then? Let's get down to the big one that's playing out right now. Yeah. The division that's being created on this planet by a laboratory made spike protein so spike protein is kind of doing its thing running around the planet mutating hopping onto people hopping onto other people and we've all had to find we've all had to go into a, a, some soul searching is to decide how we're going to contend with that and uh, certainly the media has one way to contend with it only one way and if you go outside of that way, the rest of the media is now vicious in how they make fun of someone if you don't obey the agenda now, which is highly profitable for these pharmaceutical companies. Oh, so absolutely. Can you talk about this one and anything you've seen or know around this regarding any influence coming in from beyond humanity itself. It's again a control program, um, and in some regards, I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to put myself out on a limb by saying this, but maybe even a eugenics program, okay? Um, because it's wiped out. I hear you. You know, quite a few uh, elderly and you know less, you know, people immunocompromised people, which is really pretty sad. Um, uh, I, you know, pretty much what. I've seen is that uh, it's a means of control. Okay, it's a means to keep. So just another, not, just they, they tried the false flags with the shootings. They tried all these other negative approaches. You know, people aren't buying it anymore, and and they're pulling out all stops now. It's like, oh, let's let's pretend there's this you know virus. Now the virus is real. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not. Yep. Not claiming oh, yeah. that it, it can is. be created in a lab and be real at the same time. Oh yeah, no, it's a real virus. It's it's, it's it. probably human created, but yeah. it's a real virus. But uh, but this whole idea of separation. So as long as they keep people in duality consciousness, where you got the unvaccinated against the vaccinated, or you know you got. The max, the mask people against those that don't want to wear a mask. Uh, you're going to keep humans separated, and that's their whole goal. They and don't this want is global this time. It's not oh, access to a culture, a specific ca a country or or demographic. It's everyone's now being exposed to. Oh, this everybody pandemic. is. And uh, there's certain ones of us, like myself and my husband, we choose not to be vaccinated because we. We, we believe that our own immune systems are strong enough to withstand it in our own high vibrations. Um, and and so, uh, so even if you do come down with COVID, you're going to be able to recover from it. I mean, it's 99.7% survivable, you know, so. I had it, my husband had it, and um, we are back to normal. I mean, they're really, we're not really seeing a lot of any long haulers uh, syndrome, for example. Some right. people do, but the point is, yes, there are ways to manage it. Of course, we're not being told that by the media. We've already done shows on that, but there, yeah. are, ways to, there are ways to manage that. But yes, again, this whole notion, like you just said, is really interesting. All of the kind of traumatic events that have occurred over the last 20 years, starting with 9-11 on, Mm -hmm. And the mass shooting, the increase in mass shooting, school shootings, a horrible, you know, weather related events and, and so forth. We as a species, and they, these controllers know this, um, have compassion fatigue. Yeah. That's, that's an actual term now. We right. just can only take so much in and we get numb and don't care anymore. Tell it something that now affects everybody, our kids, our grandma, and so forth. What a brilliant plan. If it was a plan, oh yeah, and I believe it is a plan. Honestly, I mean, I'm 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 of that thinking uh, that it's all been planned out and uh, it's designed. Like I said, um, I think these draconian beings or these draconian influenced 
you know, elites are, are running scared right now because they're seeing the, the consciousness expand. They're seeing people become awakened. People are no longer being duped into believing all of these, uh, you know, all, all of this, you know, brainwashing and programming. So, so they're pulling out all the stops right now. They're just go, I mean, they're not even being, I mean, they're just being blatant. I mean, they're not even trying to hide it anymore. They're just being super blatant. Yeah. And with the hopes that they can still maintain some semblance of control over humanity. And they might think they're winning, but they're actually losing. They're losing. And they know they are. On some level, they know. They do, because enough people around the world are saying, hold on a minute, I don't really want to buy into this agenda. Uh -uh. And, and that's a large percentage of people globally. Um, and I will say, um, I recently interviewed John Warner IV, who is part of the Mellon banking family and also his his father a, a five time a US senator and very much on the inside on a military level intelligence level and so forth and he was told directly by someone at a level that would know such things uh, he said well, who do you think controls things this is a this planet is alien controlled and he's like what <laughs> and of course he's been trying to unpack that and we've been having uh, he's been having conversations with people like me sharing this information we're not understanding that there is this alien control at the top you know and now david ike has been talking about it for a long time and i think it it plays much broader than just what david's talking about um and maybe just finish off seeing sharing some of the nuance of what you're seeing with some of the clients coming in right now and where the hope is coming from from these people themselves yeah that's that's a great uh, great segue to that um i i would say with some of my clients uh my clients are getting more and more experiences where they're interacting with dark beings they have dark uh dark beings, you know, entering their bedrooms at night, or, or they're having dreams about reptilians, they're having dreams about apocalyptic endings. Uh, and uh, these beings, you have to keep in mind, are fourth dimensional beings, so they can infiltrate people's dreams, okay? Um, uh, they actually infiltrated my husband's and my dreams. Uh, within two days, my husband and I both had nightmares of dark beings trying to break into our house. And so I told my husband, I need to do a house clearing. So we did, we did a house, we, we saged the heck out of the house. We, we put crystals all over the place. Um, haven't had any dreams since, you know. So if you do good protection exercises, you know, good shielding, you know, you use the high vibrational crystals, um, you set really positive intentions throughout your house. Uh, you're not going to be, uh, you shouldn't be continuing to have interactions with these beings unless, okay, there's a caveat here, unless you have a contract with them, okay? And some people that have reptilian DNA in their genetics or people of Orion genetics or Orion uh, star lineage, uh, Syrian lineage, for instance, might have some ongoing soul contracts with some of these beings. And maybe consciously they don't, you know, uh, they don't remember it, but uh, these, these contracts can transcend lifetimes. Okay. So, so if they're continuing to have, you know, be, you know, dark beings visiting them, they need to ask themselves, you know, well, where, what, on what higher level do I have a contract with them? Because that's usually the case. Very important to point out, and that's something I've I've been saying for many years. This this notion that we're somehow uh, beyond time and space and operating in a bubble and beyond our own history isn't true. Yeah. Uh, we all have these connections. Um, many many of us have connections to, as you say other star systems and if you want to look at us genetically probably just just about most most everyone on the planet has some of that going on All so right. i think it's really good to it, it's you know here we're pointing fingers at reptilians in in this show because they do have such a pronounced influence on this planet it's also important to point out there are reptilians who have higher consciousness who've moved right. on to other places who are trying to establish more of their own light forces in other places so it's not that 
it's like not all humans are bad, not all reptilians are bad. No, absolutely. And I always say that, you know, even in, you know, many of my readings, uh, I have uh, quite a few clients that who have reptilian guides, for instance, but who are positively oriented reptilians. And as destructive as they are when they're in their dark, dark mode, um, they become very benevolently restorative when they're in their light mode. So they're actually very gifted psychic and healers. Um, and I do have clients who actually have, who are Draco uh, star seeds, um, mostly dragons, but, you know, I get mostly dragons, but they have chosen for whatever reasons to incarnate as human in order to assist humanity. And those are beings that are operating from more of a light, light consciousness. Right. I think it's very important for us to kind of part on that note. And, and then, of course, there's a pantheon of other beings from other places and other dimensions that are always here at our disposal that we can, we can very conveniently call our guides if we only know they're there and call on them. So we're, we're very lucky in that way. Um, and another level, you think, geez, why is it we need them? There's something in us that's still yet to be developed. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I think, uh, but they're higher aspects of ourselves too. Absolutely, that maybe yeah. we're just not listening to. Exactly. Um, any final thoughts you'd like to impart before we say goodbye? Uh, I guess just that um, if you're having encounters with reptilians, just know that it's not as scary or it doesn't need to be as scary or as frightening as it may seem you do ultimately have the power to you you're, you're a free will being you're a divine child of source of the universe and you have the power to whether or not you want to continue to interact with these beings or not you have the choice in the end and tonight we have a patreon group going on where uh, my patreon members and you and I are going to get together and people are going to share quite a bit about the experiences. That I'm, I'm excited about that. It's really wait. exciting. And pick the brain. Anybody who's watching this, you're free to join Patreon at any, any time. We have these live events regularly with authors and various topics, but this should be a really good one tonight because there are people that really want to kind of get into their own psyche on this one. Absolutely. As you say, they can get into our heads. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, Debbie, where's the best place for people to uh, check out your work and the incredible artwork and such that you have associated with the information on your site? Thank you for that. Uh, uh, they can reach me on my website, debbiesolaris.com. That's D-E-B-B-I-E-S-O-L-A-R-A-S.com. And uh, right now I'm not taking personal readings because I'm really <laughs> booked out, but um, we will be opening the calendar hopefully later in the year for folks to maybe get their own personal reading. I'm also going to be offering a webinar on transforming galactic soul contracts that's coming up in October. So um, it should be about, I don't know, about an hour and a half long webinar. Um, so I, we try to offer webinars periodically that teach people how to um, expand their own consciousness and to develop their own psychic skills. Very cool. Glad to hear that you're doing that. Well, uh, we can take a little break, have some lunch. In a few hours, I'll be seeing you back on our live presentation. Sounds so, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Regina, for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. So everybody, you can go to DebbieSolaris.com and I uh, really worth checking out the beautiful work she's done on the various species. We really focused on reptilians this time, but there's so many beautiful species out there that are interfacing with us earthlings and we're even part of it in some cases. So yeah, in the time, thank you for joining us here on ReginaMeredith.com. <laughs>